Buckman, the President of the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey. Well, as you can see, I brought back up. <laughs> well, good afternoon and welcome to the White House. I always feel a little strange when I say that welcome to the White House and here we are across the street in the executive <laughs> office building, but they tell me that it has to have that title too. Well, it's an honor to have you join us today, although with so many conservative legislators here in Washington, I'm a little nervous about what might be getting passed back in the state houses. And as conservatives, you and I have traveled the same road. Indeed, whenever I speak to you, the audience seems to be full of old friends. And today's no exception. Perhaps you'll join me in thinking back for a moment of the distance that we as conservatives have journeyed. For decades, liberals dominated the public debate. They were full of ideas and energy, and they promised a vast social experiment with the naive excitement of those who've allowed themselves to forget the lessons of history. Under their leadership, the tax burden grew while social programs ballooned. Soon, the results of their experiment began to come in. Our once vibrant economy was growing stagnant. Thousands were being turned into permanent dependents of the welfare state. Our defenses were growing weaker, the Soviets were expanding, and our nation was losing face throughout the world. The American people retained their good sense and courage, but when they saw what the government was doing to their beloved country, they felt sick at heart. The conservative response to these developments was at first muted. We had the principles, limited government, lower taxes, incentives to work, save and invest, and a strong national defense. But we lacked political experience and a unifying voice. And then a powerful movement began to take shape. Perhaps it began in 1964 with Barry Goldwater, that plangent voice crying in the wilderness. In 1973, your own American Legislative Exchange Council was founded. By the late 1970s, we had Proposition 13 and the Sagebrush Rebellion. And then for the first time in nearly three decades, 1980, a Republican Senate was elected. And if you'll permit me, so was a conservative president. <laughs> uh, today, American vitality and vigor have been restored. The economy's growing again, and our nation created more new jobs during the past 27 months than did all the countries of Western Europe during the past 10 years. Crime is down, student test scores are up, and private sector initiatives are giving our communities new vitality. Our defenses have been strengthened. Just as important, power today has begun to flow back where it belongs, to you in your states. According to an article that appeared last month in the Christian Science Monitor, and I'll quote, from Oregon in the West to Maine in the East, the states are shouldering more responsibility. Decentralization of power, the experts say, could be one of the most long-lasting effects of this presidency. Well, what do you know? For once, the experts are right. Uh, <laughs> here, here. But those of us who, as conservatives, have traveled this long road together, we've developed the deepest possible bonds of friendship. You and I have shared the same devotions. We've shared the same setbacks and enjoyed the same triumphs. On the way, we've offered each other guidance and support. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for all that your efforts have meant to me. Having come this far, however, we face issues that this very spring will determine whether we go forward or back. Permit me to take a moment to discuss with you two of the most pressing issues, our strategic modernization program and the budget. 
Tomorrow in Geneva, American negotiators will begin the most important arms talks our nation is likely to participate in during this decade. In view of the death of Chairman Chernyenko, I'm pleased that the negotiations will begin as scheduled. And I want the Soviet leadership to know that we'll deal with Chairman Chernyenko's successor with an open mind. Later this month, while the Geneva talks are in progress, each House of the Congress will cast votes that will directly affect the outcome of the talks. These votes will shape the future of our strategic modernization program, including the Peacekeeper missile, a central component of the plans to bring our nation's deterrent forces up to date. At present, our intercontinental ballistic missiles, the land-based portion of our deterrent forces, are technologically behind the times, older in many cases than the Air Force men and women who are attending them. The deployment of the MX, moreover, is long overdue. Indeed, during the years that the Congress has debated the future of this missile, the Soviets had put in place more than 600 MX caliber missiles of their own. Deployment of the NX now represents a simple necessity. It's up to the Congress. They can either move ahead and let the world know that the America represented in Geneva is united and resolute, or they can cast a negative vote and assure Moscow that we're divided and vacillating and that our weaknesses can be exploited at the table. In the name of world peace, that must not happen. This spring, the budget and our tax reform plan will come under serious consideration. We have two main aims, each vital. First, we must win the battle to control government spending once and for all. We're asking the Congress to cut $50 billion by Easter and to do so without jeopardizing our national security. Already over the past four years, defense spending has been reduced nearly $150 billion below the five-year spending plan that I proposed in 1981. I don't think you've, any of you have seen or heard that or read it any place. Yet the military threats that we and our allies must face have not been reduced. On the contrary, they have grown. During much of the 60s and 70s, we lived in a security largely because of the investments in our national defense that had been made during the 50s. Too often, however, we failed to make the needed new investments to keep our forces credible and up to date. Today, we've begun the long overdue rebuilding. We must remain utterly determined to see it through to its completion. The plain truth is that national security is not just another category in the budget, but the first duty of the federal government to the American people. It has already been cut enough. You might be interested to know that so far, it is lower than the projected arms spending of the previous administration that they had made for these same five years. Now the Congress must summon the political courage to make reductions elsewhere. If the Congress lacks that courage, then it can at least give me the authority to veto line items in the budget. I like the kitchen, so I won't mind the heat. I Keep spending under control for future generations. We're proposing the passage of a balanced budget amendment that will require the, of the federal government what is already required in 49 of your states. I know you agree. The federal government must stop spending more than it takes in. Our second aim is to foster economic growth. And in this regard, our tax simplification plan will prove vital. During the 1970s, as the government took an ever higher proportion of earnings away from the American people, it was, in effect, punishing the very saving, investment, and initiative that lead to economic growth. And it's no wonder that the economy went bad. Yet when our cuts in personal income tax rates restored simple economic incentives, the economy recovered and began the strongest expansion in more than three decades. The lesson is clear. Incentives spur growth. And that's why our tax plan to broaden the base, cut your personal income tax rates, and simplify the tax code deserves wide and bipartisan support in the Congress. In the 12 years since the American Legislative Exchange Council was founded, you and your fellow legislators have been a tremendous service to your country, speaking out forcefully on behalf of a strong and prosperous America. With votes on the peacekeeper and the budget before us, Today, I ask you once again 
to serve our country. Please speak in your home counties and districts. Let your voices ring out in state capitals from Albany to Sacramento. And please let them be heard right here in Washington. Together, let us continue along the road that we conservatives have already traveled so far. Our destination is more than worth the effort as it shines before us, a golden land of freedom and goodwill, where achievement is limited by only by how hard we work and how big we dream. Let me just add something here. I know that our budget cuts are, have given you some problems, problems with regard to grant programs and so forth. But let me just suggest over the longer term what I really believe, having been a governor in my own state. Back along about the time that I was casting my first vote, governors in America, federal, state, and local, only took a dime out of every dollar earned. And of that dime, two-thirds was taken by the states and local governments, and only one-third by the federal government. And then with the depression of the New Deal, the federal government expanded the spending and the growth of the federal government, preempting the tax sources that should have been available at your levels of government. Then having created the problems by preempting all the tax source, the federal government says, oh, we will generously help you. We'll give you a grant. And usually it came tied with so much red tape that you had a hard time finding the program or making it work. Well, my goal is and my dream is to reshape it to the place that while, yes, in our trimming, we may have to cut some grants that have been made, I, at the same time, want to see the federal government reduce the share of the tax burden it is taking to reopen again tax resources available to state and local governments so that when you, in whatever your community or state may be, have a particular need, you, and not someone in the Washington bureaucracy, can go to the people and say, this is worth the tax that we're going to apply uh, to pay for it. And now, I knew when I came in here that my time was limited and I can't do what I'd like to do. I'm going to have to go back over to the office. I got a letter once that was sent to me from the Des Moines Register from a little girl that had written a letter to them telling her 1981 what she thought my job was. And it was pretty good. She outlined all the real problems and everything I was going to face. And then she wound up, because the letter was addressed to me, not to the paper. And then the last line was, now, get back to the Oval Office and get to work. So, <laughs> so I'll do that. Bill? Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. I want to once again express to you our appreciation for all the cooperation your administration has given to us who are out there in the field. And we want you to know that if you give us the chance, we'll continue to spread the message and fight for what we think are the right things that you are doing in Washington. God bless you. Thank you all very much. I'll leave you in the hands of you.